I, one day I suddenly decided I was going to stop smoking cigarettes mm -hmm. and suddenly decided I was going to stop alcohol, which I did. Now, the, the public thinks I did it because of transcendental meditation. It wasn't. I just made the choice and stopped. Then, again in the New York Times, I one day uh, read uh, that Krishna Murti, J. Krishna Murti, was speaking at the um, at Madison Square Garden. So we had kind of vague idea of who he was. So I said to Rita, let's go, let's go listen to him. It was, I still remember, it was 7th of January, and it was freezing cold. New York was um, uh, snowing. And there were 7,000 people waiting for Krishnamurti to speak. He was quite old by then, but very vigorous, and if you've seen pictures, very well dressed and all. Which kind of, year was this? This was late 70s. He must have been in 80s or something, but vigorous. He ran up the stairs and people started to clap, and he stopped them, and he looked very sternly as he could. And uh, he said, what are you clapping for? If you want uh, entertainment, Broadway's <laughs> across the street. <laughs> Suddenly everybody got quiet and then he must have felt bad. Yeah. That, so he said, oh, I'm so sorry, he apologized. And he said, please clap. <laughs> and then people clapped. Then he sat on a chair like this in the middle of the stage and he spoke nonstop for three hours. Then suddenly he looked at his watch. He used to wear a pocket watch. Yeah. And he realized the time was over and he stopped in mid-sentence and ran backstage and disappeared. But I was captivated. I was just totally captivated. Suddenly, it was like finding the Holy Grail that he was speaking about consciousness. He was so ahead of his time. Yeah. And, you know, nobody understood him, but they, they felt that there was some truth to it. And this thought came to me that maybe I can explain what he's saying a little better. I don't know. It was a kind of a... It wasn't coming from my ego, it was just coming from a place. And then, of course, you know, Krishnamurti had Aldous Huxley and you name it, Christopher Isherwood, and so these great intellects, you know, um, that used to hang out with him. David Baum, who was a, a contemporary of Einstein, physicist. And so I got captivated. I started to read a lot. Then somebody, a Harvard psychologist, and we were in Boston, said you should learn Transcendental Meditation. So we learned, and it was for us uh, an experience of deep silence, which I had, you know, obviously <coughs> not experienced. Then what happened is there was a conference in Washington, and Maharishi Mahesh Yogi was coming there to speak, and so this Harvard psychologist invited us and we went out of curiosity and the conference was um, very very much pure Vedanta and you know the, obviously everybody else was quite familiar because they were regulars right. so I said you know this is not for me it was too much and you know I walked out of the conference I went to the restroom and I was coming out and Maharishi was coming out of the conference room. He saw me, I was the only Indian. He said, kya kar rahe ho? in Hindi mein. And I said, uh, kush nahi. And he said, upar aajau. So we went upstairs, <coughs> Rita went with me. And he asked me a lot of questions about what I was doing. And I was telling him about brain chemistry. And he said, kya brain chemistry? You know, you should understand consciousness because brain chemistry depends on consciousness. And I said, what's he talking Rita kept saying, let's go to Boston. And he kept saying, nahi thodi der tero. And then she said to him, um, Harishi, you know, you're, she was, you know, we didn't know who he was. Yeah. And so she said, we have to get home. We have babysitters and Deepak has to go to work. And he said, no, he should leave everything and do Ayurveda. Ayurveda, you know, so um, Rita said, so who's going to pay the mortgage? Where's the mortgage going to come from? <laughs> she said to him, where's the money going to come from? Yeah. And he kind of grinned and he said, the money will come from wherever it is at the moment, <laughs> which I never <laughs> heard that statement. So we left, though, 
And then on the airport, on the way to the airport, there was a friend of mine who's very involved, by the way, he's Jerry Bordica. He's now with the WHO. He comes here a lot for the WHO. He's become a world authority on Ayurveda. He gave me a little book, uh, Vasant Lard's uh, from, uh, Way of Life Ayurveda. I read it on the flight from Washington to Boston. I was so intrigued by the underlying principles, the theory, that I went back. I took the flight back from Boston to Washington and asked to see Maharishi. Maharishi and he was busy, he couldn't see me. Yeah. So I said to the assistant, I'll wait till he sees me. And I waited three days outside his door wow. till he saw me. Right. Then things took off. He introduced right. me to a lot of people, University of Baroda, Ahmedabad, Rishikesh. And then I realized, although Ayurveda was interesting, it wasn't what I was really interested in was the Vedanta that was the basis of it. Uh -huh. okay. So that became my journey then. Yeah. So you actually worked with Mahesh uh, oh. and you became sort of his right hand person. I did. And you taught a lot of his philosophy, etc. Yes. And uh, you know, in some ways that was your awakening. Uh, it prophecy. was, again, you know, if you read the press about Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, it's all over the place. Yeah. You know, Beatles saying this, George Harrison saying this, John Lennon saying this, Mia Farrow, I mean, uh, people criticizing him for money, accusing him of things, etc. And, you know, you realize sometimes that when you know a person and you get to know them, they may have their contradictions and their paradoxes. But when I was with him those 11, 12 years, I was totally captivated again by the fact that he was at home with mathematicians, physicists, biologists, you name it. He was the most amazing intellect. Of course, by now I had also followed, by the way, Krishnamurti a little bit. I became friends with Mrs. Aldous Huxley, who was Aldous Huxley's widow, who had another interesting story all over the road. So I was hanging out with all these people, but I found Maharishi to be an amazing person, so, intellectually. Yeah, and then after being together in about 93, 94, you sort of decided to go your separate ways. And again, press wrote about he felt that you were getting more attention than him. But I want the real story. Why did you guys split? Well, the real story was actually well, there's a backstory. Maharishi got very sick in India. My father was his physician. There were rumors that he had been poisoned. He had kidney failure, lung failure, etc. I came to India and my father said the only way he will possibly survive is if he gets dialysis or something. So I flew to England and I got him an admission in uh, Harley Street. This is really not much public knowledge. I got him a little admission in a private place in a, under an assumed Muslim name. He's a beard and all this, so fine. And uh, you know, in, in England those days, you could pay cash and be anonymous. Uh, the Arabs especially would come into Harley Street. Maharishi was very sick for a while. And uh, he slowly recovered. Again, my father was his physician. He came to England as well. But in the movement, the TM movement, which had five, six million people, he had quote unquote gone into silence. Nobody knew what the real facts were. So for three, four months, he was in the hospital. Then we moved him to a hotel. I actually was his nurse because he wouldn't take female nurses. You had to be brahmacharya and all this. So we used to walk him in Hyde Park and one day somebody actually stopped us and said, hey, he's the guru of the Beatles. That's how he was known, you know, despite all his other... Uh, other yeah. So my, uh, Rita said, no, no, he's my father-in-law. <laughs> but we realized it was dangerous to be in London, so actually we went to a place outside of London in southwest um, England. And for a year, he recovered. And he did very well. <clears throat> Rita went back to Boston. I used to fly back and forth. And then I started going on his behalf to other countries. 
Soviet Union at that time, not Russia, okay, yeah. the Eastern Bloc countries, etc. And I started introducing Vedanta and meditation and so on. So now I found myself in a very strange position. I would show up in Warsaw, Poland, and there would be a thousand people and they would garland me, which I wasn't used to. So people started looking at me as his uh, substitute or whatever, but treating me with the same adulation. And I felt totally it wasn't my thing. Then in 1993, there was a Guru Purnima in um, Holland, in a small place called uh, Flodrop. And this is, by the way, the first time I'm talking about this. Nobody asked me all these details. So um, I, Guru Purnima, um, everybody had, you know, it was a long day of ceremonies and rituals and reading of Rig Veda, etc., etc. And then uh, Rita and I went to see him around, it must have been midnight. And he said very lovingly, he says, you know all these people around me, they're saying that you're competing with me. But he did say it. At that moment, something happened in my consciousness. And it was again the same story with Mahid, the endocrine guy. I said, I want to leave. And I, this place is not for me. First of all, I'm not competing with them. Secondly, I'm not into all this ritual stuff, you know, but to the extent that they were. So I said, Maharishi, I want to leave. And he said, no, no, think about it, etc. He said, I was just treating you like a child, you know. That's what people are saying. I said, but they may say it, and there may be the perception. First of all, I would not dare to do that. And secondly, you know, I don't like the atmosphere around you. I said that. And then he got upset. He said, if you go, I'll be indifferent to you. I said, that's your choice. He said, stay for 24 hours and decide. I said, no, I've decided. So we walked out of there at midnight, drove all the way to um, Amsterdam, took a flight. And when I got home in Boston, the phone was ringing and he was on the line. He said, I want you to come back. Uh, you are like my son. I said, it's over. You were so close. It's almost like a father-son It was, yes. And to walk out, I mean, did you miss him? Or, I mean, what was it like afterwards? Making the decision is one thing, but afterwards, did you feel that was the right thing? Or I felt it was the right thing because I didn't want to be part of an organization, and I say this with all humility, but, you know, the gurudams in India become very cultish mm -hmm. and competitive. So this is your guru, you can't talk to that guru, you can't do this, you can't do that. That was, I was seeing that. It wasn't for me. Now, my personal relationship, I learned a lot from, from him. I'm very grateful. It set me off in a very interesting trajectory. But I also learned what I was not interested in. There were lots of aspects of the movement that I was bothered by. The emphasis on, you know, the faithfulness of the disciple, the money, and all of that. So I felt it was right. And then, you know, I had you know, some internal relationship with Maharishi, but that was it. I went back the next Guru Purnima which is a year later, yeah. to see him and to pay my respects. And he asked me how things were. I said, they're fine. But he didn't ask me, do you want to come back? I think he had sensed. Mm -hmm. And that was the last time I saw him. Yeah. And what did you feel when he died? I mean, I felt a big loss. And uh, I also felt that, you know, he, despite that severe bout of illness, he recovered. He was well over 90. He uh, died uh, in Mahasamadhi. He actually, when announced that he was leaving, he went into silence. He sent messages to his people. Uh, I got a message too, okay, that he was saying goodbye. And he actually went into Mahasamadhi. And this was, the, I mean, it was a true Rishi. Yeah. And so after, the last question I have to ask you is, you were a lot of celebrities calling you their guru. And I have to ask you about two particular celebrities. You know, one is Michael Jackson. You were close to him. 
and the other is Oprah Winfrey, who's going to be interviewing you in a couple of days. Oprah, I said, if you had married me, you could, you could be Oprah Chopra. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, phew, thank God. <laughs> so, so tell me about, you know, I mean, obviously, if someone like Michael Jackson is all over the map in, uh, in, in the press, uh, you know, his, the adulation is unbelievable. And at the same time, you know, people see him, you know, bleaching his skin, etc. But you somehow connected to him as a person. So tell us a little bit about Michael. First of all, when I met Michael, he was very young. He was very innocent. And uh, um, we had great times, you know, in L.A. We, he would disguise himself because he wanted to, he was a voracious reader. Uh, he, wa he never had a school education, so he was interested in philosophy. He used to read Tagore, I introduced him to Tagore, I introduced him to the Upanishads. So at that time he was totally innocent and he was also the most amazing performer. I remember we had gone to Romania and we were in Bucharest and um, there must have been half a million people. And the whole town was crazy and he did four hours of non-stop performance and we went to his room and he had a glass of water. Then the Pepsi commercial, he burnt his skin and his scalp got singed. Right. That's when the problem started. Doctors started giving him narcotics. He became dependent to some extent on that. The skin bleaching is the totally false thing. He had vitiligo, or leukoderma. And he had, uh, what do you call it, he had an autoimmune disease, so he had patches of skin all over his body that were getting white. He was obsessed with his appearance because he was a tortured soul. He, he came from a family where many people would say that his father was abusive. And he, no matter how good he was, he thought he was not good enough. He was trying to still live up to his father's expectations. Genius and tortured soul can go together. I've seen it many times. And that's one reason, by the way, that not celebrities, but artists are attracted to me because I can see the tortured soul of an artist, which sometimes also sparks their genius. So I've known many artists like that. Not to the extent of, um, of George. You know what I mean? Lady Gaga is a good friend of mine, and she was actually having nightmares, and I haven't told this story to anyone. But I said, why don't you channel your nightmares into your sets for the show when she did it? And yeah. you look at those sets, they're out of this world. Right. They're her dreams and her nightmares uh -huh. expressed in music. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, what about Oprah? Yeah. Tell, tell me about Oprah. What about her? What is she like? How did you meet her? Tell us about her journey where she's going to be interviewing you. Oprah has uh, some very fascinating traits. Number one, she is again a voracious reader. And for an author who makes a living selling words, that's what I do for a living, right? You take 26 letters of the alphabet and you have infinite potential <laughs> right there in 26 letters. Infinite number of stories, infinite um, versions of science, all in 26 letters. Oprah reads. That's why she used to have a book club. She right. became a powerhouse. So I've always wondered what was the source of her power, because she's power, a powerful woman. It doesn't matter if you're a president, or head of state, or the biggest Hollywood star, you want to be with Oprah because they want to be in her company. It's just, it's just who she is. Um, I've thought about that for many, many years. I think here's her secret. She's intelligent. She's not afraid of being criticized. She, I wouldn't say she's immune to criticism because none of us is, but less and less personally offended by criticism. Because, you know, anybody who does anything will be vilified and criticized and at the same time praised, but cannot be ignored. 
you know, that, that there was Steve Jobs in one of his speeches. He said, you can criticize people like that, you can vilify them, you can do whatever you can, but you can't ignore them. Okay? So she is immune to criticism. She's a very fearless woman. She's ready to jump into the, own, uh, into the unknown. Um, but the most important quality she has is she knows how to connect. And connects because she doesn't pretend to be who she's not. She's, you see what you get, or you get what you see. What is the expression? She's, she radiates a simple, unaffected humanity. And that's very endearing to people. So are you looking forward to her interviewing you for the show? Yes, I am. Actually, I was in Brazil about a month ago, and my cell phone rang and said, this is Oprah. I said, hi. She said, um, <coughs> I want to come to India with you, and I want to do an interview there. I said, sure. She said, can I make it official? I said, of course. You don't need my permission. And it evolved since then. Uh, it will be that the, what she's doing with me is part of a series called Oprah Next.